Welcome, everyone. Thanks again for, uh, for coming today uh, to see Indie Bio's uh, demo day for batch number four, winter 2017. Uh, we're really excited and really happy and honored to actually share the 13 teams that we've been working with in the last four months, accomplishments, with all of you here today. I want to say a quick thank you uh, and uh, shout out to SOSV, the venture capital fund behind IndieBio, um, as well as TechCrunch for live streaming this demo day again to the thousands of people around the world that can't actually be here today. Um, it's, a, it's a huge honor for us to be able to, to share that with the world. So uh, thanks again. Uh, I want to tell you just a couple things about IndieBio and what it is we're trying to do in the world uh, and give a little bit of context to, to what you're about to see. So very simply put, IndieBio helps scientists become entrepreneurs. And we do that through blending science, deep science, deep technology, and design to approach product development in a new way. And so through a bunch of the learnings that we've created in the past four batches, we're starting to get there faster and faster. Um, but that's not all. We're also learning how to ex expose that to other institutions and learn from institutions around the world as well. So we have partnerships now with almost all the top major research universities in the world, uh, as well as, and I'm very proud to say, major, major government institutions like NIH and the United Nations most recently. In fact, how we've been speeding up science uh, and actually taking science and making it more relevant and applied uh, has led to numerous international delegations come to IndieBio and ask us how we can take our learnings and expose it to the networks and ecosystems that they have in their home countries. Um, and in the process, what we've found and, and we're starting to really see is we're disrupting sector by sector, vertical after vertical, uh, new areas that biology has traditionally not touched. Uh, verticals like uh, consumer goods, food and agriculture, therapeutics, manufacturing, and, and most recently, information technology as well. In short, what we're seeing is biology as a technology starting to slowly reinvent the world. One problem area, massive problem area at a time. Because only biology has the power and the breadth to actually affect the things that matter to us most, which is living systems themselves. So I'd like to introduce our team, uh, amazing team, and uh, really all of us bring a, such a different viewpoint to, to biology and what we're trying to do that together uh, I think it's, it's the best I've ever seen, so I'm just really proud of them. Um, Ron, our chief science officer, uh, June, our science director, Alex, our program manager, and Ryan, of course, our program director. So I'd like to, them to each uh, say a little something about what they've been learning. All right. Thank you, Arvind. So uh, talking about science, uh, uh, there's a couple things I want to say. First of all, it's an extreme pleasure to be here with you today because you're about to see a whole bunch of new things that nobody's ever seen before. Uh, the teams here are presenting uh, solutions to problems that have been longstanding issues in research for years. Um, others of them uh, have invented completely new things. Um, and uh, a third of the company, a quarter of the companies have come in, they had no, no, nothing but a paper plan when they came in. They had done no physical work. Uh, another quarter of them been working on the companies for, uh, on their projects for over two years, right? All of them together have come to this point today where they're going to present tangible work that they've done that shows that their technology is real and commercializable and valuable. Right. And the reason that this works for us, is what, as I see it, is that the, the companies themselves form a collaborative community and the team helps combine with them to make it happen as a network. Right. But it's not going to stop right there. The Indie Bioscience team and the team in general continues to work with the companies as they move through the rest of their process to become full-fledged profitable companies. Uh, we're graduating our 55th company today and we're with them all the way. The science team will help export the, the analytics pipelines and the technical development pipelines that they've developed during the program into new spaces. We help them build out the lab spaces and find the lab spaces if they need it. 
And, and June and I will also be working on new technologies and bringing them into the community and into our lab to disseminate over the entire portfolio. So Indie Bioscience will continue to be with them all the way. So I'm gonna bring June up here and she's gonna talk about uh, some of the things that happen inside the program. Thank you. As Arvin had mentioned, uh, the biggest goal of Indie Bio is to transition scientists into entrepreneurs. And we do this in three ways. First of all, we shift the mindset of science from academic discovery to product development. And you will see today that every single company has not only achieved their scientific milestones, but they have built a product that customers want. And in turn, now the customer feedback is what drives their science. Secondly, we practice clear and effective communication to explain science to the world. And lastly, of course, we train scientists in all aspects of business, which Alex will talk about now. All right, thank you, June. Um, so just like the science is accelerating, the businesses are actually progressing faster than ever. So for the first time out of all four of our classes, every single team has gotten to revenue, raised hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars in funding, or gotten partnerships with key players in their industry before the end of the program. And to do this, the teams are interacting with key players very, very early to learn from the market and to find true product market fit. So that means teams are actually doing product and business development from each of these interactions. And for the very early teams, they're actually building the fund fundamentals and foundations of their business alongside of each of these. So during four months, we really believe that teams are learning skills that takes many biotech companies years. And now I'm gonna hand it to Ryan, who's gonna talk about what happens after the program. Thank you, Alex. So as our teams evolve, we evolve. So beyond Indie Bio, we actually continue to support our teams as they start to scale their sales and marketing infrastructure. That basically means as these companies pass the million dollars in sales mark, and in some cases, million dollars in sales per month mark, we continue to support them and help them with building sales, marketing, and then also raising the capital, the follow-on capital they need from the millions of dollars in their seed round up to Series A and beyond when they start looking at tens of millions of dollars moving forward. In addition, we help our teams as, as they start to scale uh, from both a recruiting and operational perspective. So taking your team from a two to four person team to a 20 to 30 person team is hard and we help with both advisors, mentors, uh, as well as additional support as well. Uh, and this is actually one of the teams that have scaled. Several of our, our teams are actually in that photo uh, and they are over 30, 30 people in size. So as they're looking at new industries, they're also tackling regulated markets. That was our vision initially. When we started Indie Bio, we felt that it was really important to not just tackle the less regulated markets, but the more regulated markets. And our teams are moving into food, healthcare, and uh, infrastructure, many other areas which are normally uh, very difficult to tackle industries and actually getting approvals, including FDA approvals and others. So what's next? Well, in the uh, words of, of one of my favorite authors, of visionaries and scientists, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, the way to explore the limits of the possible is to go beyond uh, the impossible and find, find those places. So tonight, we are actually delighted to introduce you to 13 new biotech companies pushing the edges of the possible. Thank you very much, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hyunjun Park. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Catalog. And thank you so much for joining us on Demo Day. I'm thrilled to share with you the story of my company. Catalog is building infinite data archives in DNA. Now, why do we need infinite data archives? The thing is, with all of the data that we're generating, with our phones, internet searches, scientific research, that every single moment of everyone's lives is a new hard drive in a data server somewhere. Because of this, by 2020, 
we're going to have to store 100 zettabytes of information. That's a mind-boggling number. 10 times the number of bytes as there are stars in the observable universe. Now that's a problem because of the way we do things now. Data centers for cloud servers are expensive and unscalable. If you want to store things for longer for archival storage, the state of the art in 2017 is caves. But despite this, the market for archival storage as well as disaster recovery is growing at an extremely fast rate projected to grow to over $7.5 billion by 2020, over $11 billion for disaster recovery by 2021. And that's why we turn to DNA. It's the medium that's been perfected over 4 billion years of evolution to store nature's most precious information. DNA can store a million times more information per given volume than flash. It will retain that information for thousands of years. You can read back data that was stored in a dead horse for 700,000 years if it was stored in DNA. Finally, DNA is extremely cheap and easy to copy. That means you can go from one to a billion molecules, all identical, within a matter of hours. So you can have as many redundancies as you want in your data. But despite these advantages, DNA hasn't become a storage medium yet. Why is that? It's the cost. To synthesize enough DNA to store 1,000 terabytes of information, it would cost $240 trillion. The state of the art in DNA information storage is based on synthesis. That means the information is encoded in the base sequence, in the sequence of the base pairs of the DNA. This means that the more data you store, the more DNA you have to synthesize. And synthesis is expensive. This is where our shift in thinking comes in. We no longer store information in the sequence of the base pairs, but in the presence or absence of the DNA molecules themselves. To go around the problem of having to maintain a large, diverse set of DNA oligos, we use a combinatorial assembly approach using prefabricated DNA. Importantly, no new synthesis is required. So this is a catalog platform at work, encoding the sentence, how catalog encodes information. You'll notice that no new synthesis was required. And that's what allows us to bring down that cost of storing a petabyte of information when accounting for just the enzymes required for the assembly of the oligos to $5,000. That represents a 50 billion fold improvement over the previous method. So our progress so far, one month into the IndieBio program, we encoded a kilobyte of data, the road not taken by Robert Frost. For demo day for you guys today, we did a thousand times that and encoded the entire novel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Thank you. <clears throat> With the seed funding that we're raising right now, we have a clear path to get to a gigabyte per day by the end of the year. Six months from that, we'll get to a terabyte. And with these new thresholds and capacity, we'll be able to do pilots with customers and address that really big archival and disaster recovery market. And who knows what other markets that we might be able to pioneer using this new technology. The business will look like this. We're looking at financial, medical, pharmaceutical, technological, and scientific sectors. They'll send us the data online or by sending us hard drives. We will do all the encoding into DNA and decoding out of DNA in-house. And once the data is inside DNA molecules, we'll use that to archive, copy, or transport the information. The team right now is myself and my co-founder, Nate Roquette. We were members of a top synthetic biology lab at MIT and really proud of 
the accomplishments we've had over the last four months. Um, <clears throat> just yesterday, we were able to successfully close the, the note round that we raised to help us in moving out of IndieBio. Uh, because of overwhelming interest, we've had to take 40% over our target amount. We just couldn't turn away the value add on top of the capital that the investors were offering. Uh, thanks largely to introductions made by IndieBio, as well as our early investor, 50 Years Ventures, we now have full commitment over for the entire amount that we're raising for the seed round. Thank you. Hi, we're Scaled Biolabs, and we are scaling down biology. I'm Drew, our CEO, and I'd like to tell you why this is really important for accelerating discovery. An example from the computing industry might help. The computing industry started off relying on humans to move information around, shown here in the 1920s. And needless to say, this was not so efficient. Thankfully, they hugely upscaled their productivity, by miniaturizing their processes onto microchips and developing software to run them. Now, biomedical research looked much the same as the computing industry did in the 1920s. In 2017, nothing's changed. <laughs> Things still look exactly the same. And what this means is our best and brightest minds at leading research institutes around the world spend the bulk of their time in the lab doing manual, repetitive tasks not making discoveries. And this is a serious problem, not just for them, because this is one reason why pharma now has a large, growing productivity problem. Fewer drugs make it to market each year, despite a soaring R&D spend. We keep throwing the same inefficient processes at increasingly complex problems. The core experimental cycle in a biomedical R&D lab suffers from bottlenecks, and it hasn't changed in decades. Manual handling is still required to connect a series of outdated tools in series. So this means that the researcher's output is limited by how many experiments they can assemble, run, and analyze in a day. And robotics only automates this process without improving the tools or workflow. So clearly, the way we're doing biology today needs to be upgraded. So we took inspiration from the computing industry and designed miniaturized fluid circuits to overcome these roadblocks. So this approach allows us to take all those functions of a biomedical lab and shrink them down into a microchip. But we didn't just put the, the ability to do one or two experiments on this system. We put thousands of experiments side by side this allows us to scan through many more conditions to find potential cures in just a fraction of the time. Yet it fits, of course, in the palm of your hand. This chip enables parallel biology on an unprecedented scale. Shown here is just one out of the more than 8,000 cell experiments happening in parallel from start to finish in our chip. And so this turbocharges biology freeing the scientists from many hours at the bench and getting them back to understanding the science. But we've accelerated that as well. Here are four experiments out of our 8,000, and what you're seeing is a biologist's unaided view of the experiment, which is, in this case, cells turning into various types of tissue. Our software platform leverages machine learning to identify details that even the trained biologist's eye cannot see. This reveals hidden biology. And so our software platform makes very simple not just the process of analyzing, but understanding 8,000 experiments. In this way, the software platform is, is empowering scientists to understand the full depth and breadth of thousands of experiments, which are compared in parallel to find the optimal outcome. 
And importantly, we can see all the properties of every cell in every experiment on an individual basis. So the key thing here is that parallel experimentation combined with automated processing is what is allowing us to turbocharge biology. So what have scientists been able to achieve so far using our system? Well, how about this? We're very proud to say that our academic collaborators used our technology to help work out how to grow a human kidney in a dish made from stem cells. This is absolutely game-changing for the more than two million sufferers of renal disease worldwide. Imagine if we could bring that impact to other areas of human health, because this is just one lab's efforts. Imagine the world once we get this system into every scientist's hands. And that's what we're doing, because we're already seeing significant traction with our customers. Shown here are some of the companies bringing online new therapies who are set to benefit from the advantages and already are benefiting from the advantages of our technology. But they're not just nice logos, because they've already started to generate revenue for us. In just four months, we've seen significant revenue growth, and we've booked more than $160,000 with 200% month-on-month growth. Our business model is to sell a complete research platform, and this consists of a $200,000 benchtop instrument, single-use chips at $500 each, and the software platform, which is licensed to enterprises. We sell this platform into large, growing markets that are the future of medicine. We start with a strategy of winning smaller markets like cell therapies that have an immediate fit with our technology, and then grow into larger markets as we go on. So we differentiate ourselves from the competition on, on two main factors. The ability to offer more experiments happening in parallel and more properties or detail measured in those experiments. But our real secret source is the ability to allow the experiment, analysis, uh, readout, and the analysis of that data on the same platform. We've put in place manufacturing partners to help us develop our microfluidic chips, and benchtop instruments, and they have proven track records. But we also care about doing solid science, which is why we have a strong pipeline of academic publications, and we're proudly the inventors of our core IP. So we've already prototyped and are running our, our, our whole platform, and we've brought in our first revenue by de uh, deploying that within the cell therapy space. Going forward, we'll be entering the immuno-oncology market and eventually even personalized medicine. But our most uh, important asset is the team. I'm a stem cell bioengineer who developed this platform and showed its um, proof of value in, in various stem cell settings. Our CSO, Justin Cooper-White, is a research leader in microfluidics, and he's our interface to the academic world, so he provides a constant stream of upgrades to our technology. And our CTO, Brendan Griffin, handles our bioinformatics needs because he's an expert in data analytics and has experience applying large-scale computing uh, in the physics world. And together, we're the right team to execute on our vision, which is to bring the biology lab out of the past and into the 21st century, where it belongs. So please join us in doing that. We're raising a $2 million seed round now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome on this rainy day. I'm Dr. John Mendelson. I'm the CEO, I'm not CEO, I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Founder of DXRX Medical. And I'm here to share with you our revolutionary new treatment system for excessive drinking and alcohol abuse. But before I teach, tell you about what we do, let's meet Mike. Mike is actually a very typical alcoholic, and he's not your stereotypical patient. He's in his 30s, he's successful, he's married, he has a career, everything is going his way. But for many years, Mike has been drinking heavily, and his drinking has escalated to the point where he no longer is in control. He can't stop when he needs to. So eventually, Mike hits a wall. In this case, literally. And not in front of his family. And now his problem is out in the open. Everyone can see what's going on, and he knows it needs to be addressed. So Mike goes to his doctor, and she recommends AA. 
he tries AA, but he finds it, he finds it shaming. And he finds the stigma of being exposed as an alcoholic just too much to take, so he stops going to meetings. He looks at rehab, but rehab will take a whole month of his life off work, plus cost an enormous amount of money. So what's he do? He does nothing. He continues to drink. His life spirals down. He loses his marriage. He loses his job. He loses his family. He loses his dignity. Now he looks a lot like the stereotypical alcoholic that you all think about. Turns out, there are a lot of people just like Mike in the United States. 34 million people are diagnosed in the United States with the alcohol use disorder. Yet only 2.5 million of them get treatment in any year. And the ones who are treated spend an enormous amount at this basically end-stage treatment. DXRX has built a treatment solution available for all people with alcohol use disorder and excessive drinking. And our solution is, is available today and, and doing very nicely. So we have expanded the, 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 the treatable market. Uh, our, our solution is unique in several ways. It, it's private, it's done at home using a telemedicine platform. There's no shame or stigma involved. We use FDA approved medications like naltrexone and we use breathalyzers which quantify alcohol use in real time to monitor behavior. Our, our outcomes are patient driven. Because we treat earlier, we're able to return people to social drinking as well as to support abstinence. There's no other service like us at all. So you can think of addiction as sitting at the intersection of biological, psychological, and social factors. We attack the biological portions by using medications that are, again, safe, effective, and approved, and physician management. We attack the psychological portion using breathalyzers to monitor behavior in real time. And we have care coaches, coaches and counselors who provide needed therapy. Our social platforms allow integration of, of, of people from the outside, including family members and spouses, and uh, provide a, a network effect for patients to maintain their, uh, their, their treatment goals. Let me show you exactly how it works in this little video. First, patients find us on the web, they download our applications and install them. Second, they have a comprehensive medical vision with, with, with our expert physician, where a treatment plan is crafted. Third, they are prescribed medication, and we assure medication adherence by photographing the pills in their hand as they take them. Fourth, they breathalyze twice a day in a very easy ritual, and this documents their alcohol use. Next, they involve their inner circle in, in a social network who supports their recovery. And finally, everyone gets to see their drinking decline over time. There, it's, so, does this tr treatment work? It does very nicely. What you're seeing in this slide are data from our first 12 patients looking at the percent alcohol reduction over the one, uh, one month period. And there are several features to notice. Number one, we get a 60% decline in drinking over this time period. That's impressive. Many of our patients do attain sobriety if they want to obtain that. So we both suppress drinking or patients attain sobriety. The second thing to notice is that dense data matters. We have data every day on patients, and that's really important. No one else has data like this in any, almost any treatment field in medicine. And finally, patients stay with us. Our 30-day retention so far has been 100%. So how, why does all this work? How come no one else has come to this? Well, problem drinkers have a chronic condition, and we know that. And we know there's no cure for addiction, so we need to stay with our patients every day and provide, and we do that by providing empowering, light touches that keep them engaged. Because addiction is a disease of denial, we provide objective feedback so patients know what's going on and have, a, have, have, have real numbers to work with. Because drinking destroys relationships, we've created an inner circle of people, of, that, of, of, of those people that are important to the patient to support their recovery. And because stress causes relapse, we're there when patients need us. Not at some random office hour, but when they actually need us to come to them. We've been up and running and enrolling patients, and we're showing a 30% week-over-week growth rate. And most importantly in this slide, 80% of the patients we're enrolling have never been in treatment before. We're reaching a new market and a new group, and hopefully this will prevent the, the, the declines you see with alcoholism. Since joining Indie Bio, we've achieved many of our milestones. We've launched our services, including our web-based services and our apps in uh, early December. We filed four patents to protect unique co co components of our services. We've enrolled our first cohort of patients and they've completed 30-day data. And we partnered with key players in the healthcare industry, including a Yale hospital that's hoping to decrease uh, recidivism and readmission, the National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, who want to deploy some of their apps on our, our system, and Dignity Health, who wants to also decrease readmission rates. So for any treatment to really work, to be really accepted, it has to be both available and effective. And you can think of rehab as being moderately effective, but not very available. It just costs a lot of money. And you can think of AA as being very available, but not very effective. 
Our treatment is both effective and available and will become the benchmark for addiction therapy in the United States. Our business model includes a, payment, a, 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 a portion of patient payments and insurance payments to yield about $300 per month per patient. This gives us a lifetime treatment value of $1,200, and we have 50% estimated gross margins. Our, 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 our total available market at these prices is $38 billion. Our team is pretty darn impressive. I'm the, uh, well, maybe not me, but the rest of the team is, certainly. I'm, I'm a physician. I'm an internist and, and clinical pharmacologist. I've been conducting NIH-funded research in the addictions as a principal investigator for 30 years, and I've also been in practice about that long. David Deacon, our CEO, has launched uh, four of his own companies, two led to successful exits, and he's been an angel funder in 20 others. Bob Nix, our CTO, has spent the last nine years at Athena Health building out their systems, and before that was vice president of engineering or C uh, a founder in seven other companies. Our scientific advisors are the leaders in the field. Chuck O'Brien developed naltrexone for alcoholism. Ivan Diamond's a molecular biologist and uh, founded the UCSF Gala Center. Warren Bickle, uh, his work sits at, the, it sits at the intersection of psychology and technology, and all are, are, are awarded recognized experts from NIH and the addiction uh, research community. So are we just going to do alcoholism? No. Our systems will also work for opiate addiction and nicotine addiction, and we will, we will move to those as well as soon as we uh, you know, get this really working well. So everyone in this room has a friend, a family member, a colleague, a neighbor who's been felled by alcoholism. And if you really care about those people, and you really care about your communities, and you care about yourself, too, because you know, it affects all of us as friends and family members, then we're raising a $3 million seed round, and we'd like to have you join us. Please f find us afterwards, and we can talk. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hello everyone, we are BioInspira. We are taking gas sensing to the next level. In 2010, September 9th, early evening, when people are having dinner with family, a 30-inch diameter natural gas pipeline exploded into flames in the residential neighborhood of San Bruno. A suburb of San Francisco is only two miles west of San Francisco airport. Unfortunately, eight people died in the explosion. 58 people were injured, and 100 homes were destroyed or damaged. Every year in the United States, there are more than 200 pipeline-related incidents similar to this happened. Besides, simply by leaking gas itself, we are losing $5 billion worth of gas annually in the States. And this is because current gas detection solutions fall short in terms of cost, accuracy, and connectivity. Utility companies literally have to send people into the field using handheld detectors to walk through their pipeline or using mobile surveyors to drive through their territory for leak inspection. And it takes them so long, a complete scan of their territory can take three years or more. This is ridiculously inefficient. And the problems of current sensing technologies are that they are either too bulky, too expensive, require too much power, or they are cheap, small, but with low sensitivity. All of these can enable real-time and remote monitoring for the industry. We need technology that combines the advantage of both systems. My name is Ray, founder and CEO of BioInspira. We have a revolutionary technology that does just that. Our chemical sensors are made from M13 bacterial phage. We engineer specific design receptors into phages. Selecting phages to sense specific chemicals is simple. By using phage display, a well-developed high-throughput natural selection process, we can develop new types of sensor for almost all chemicals in less than three months. And then we grow the engineer phage in E. coli to make countless identical copies and make them into arrays of colored thin films. 
These color thin films will change colors depending on types of gases and concentrations. We then digitally analyze these films through color sensors and wirelessly transmit all this information back to our central cloud server for follow analysis, where we do event notifications and predictive maintenance for our customers. This is a patent-pending technology we invented at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and BioInspira is the global exclusive licensee to it. With our technology, we surpass current sensing limitations to provide wireless, small, low-cost, low-power, and accurate sensors. This makes it possible to have real-time and large area monitoring that can identify and fix problems much before they develop into catastrophic events. In my hand, I hold our first prototype that was done at IndieBio. This sensor module can detect up to five different gases at once to give a unique pattern for the air composition. And the white box is our whole sensor system that includes batteries and wireless communication module. By the end of this year, we will shrink the size of the whole system down to only two cubic inch, which can fit into my hand. Here you can see our sensor array gives different patterns when exposing to different chemicals. We can detect methane, ethane, and mercaptan, the order when they put into natural gas at 100 parts per million and one parts per million, respectively. And our sensor also shows very stable and fast responses over repetitive exposure cycles. We've conducted more than 100 interviews with potential customers and industry experts, so we understand very well what they need and their specifications. We compare pricing, sensitivity range, power requirement, along with other technologies and customers' needs. We are at the sweet spot and the only one that can implement detection grid for the industry. We are first targeting the whole vertical of natural gas industry, which is a $4.5 billion market. By including the global market of gas sensors and analyzers, we are looking at a total addressable market of $18.8 .8 billion with a fast growth rate, 11% annual growth rate over the next four years. Our business model includes one-time sensor sales and recurring service fee. This ensures easy adoption and continuous revenue stream. Sensor networks are not just a vision. This is happening right now. And I'm so excited to share with you that we've landed a pay pilot from consortium of utility companies that includes two largest utilities in the States and one largest utility in the East Coast. Besides, we already signed four letter of intents that come with more than 600 units per order and potentially half million dollar contracts. On the manufacturing side, we partner with the major ODM in Asia to help us deliver our products to customers. In the past four months, we've been granted more than accumulated $1.8 million non-diluted government funding from National Science Foundation and Taiwan Ministry of Science and Technology. I have a strong team to support me. Benson and I have been working together on this technology for more than three years. Jimmy has more than 20 years' experience in hardware system-level design, and Dr. Dunn has been working in biotechnology industry for the past 15 years. Our lead advisor is Ram Shenoy, who is the former city of Conoco Phillips and former advisory board to the U.S. Secretary of Energy. We also have former CTO of HP and former VP of Oracle on board as our business strategy advisors. With the ability to develop new sensors more quickly and more economically than current sensing technologies, we can go into new markets very fast, such as refineries, commercial buildings, coal mining industry, and airports. They are all billion dollar size markets, and we already have plans to penetrate all these markets in the next five years. We've successfully raised $1.3 million, and we are now raising a $3 million round to expedite our business and product development. Come join our journey and let us build a safe and smart world together. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you in this beautiful theater. How many of you here today have a dog or cat at home or know someone with a dog or cat? <laughs> wow, it's at least half of you. Well, then you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that there are more dogs and cats in the US than there are children. I'm Holly Gans, and I'm CEO and founder of Animal Biome. Animal Biome creates microbiome assessments and therapies to improve the health and wellness of dogs and cats. Up until recently, I was a researcher at UC Davis, go Aggies, where I studied co-evolution between microbes and animals. And yes, that's a cheetah up in the upper right photo. I began studying the microbiology of domestic cats when I launched this citizen science project called Kitty Biome on Kickstarter. We used crowdfunding and crowdsourcing to create the world's largest database of the microbiology of cats, dogs, and their close relatives. And from this research, we learned two things. First, we found that dogs and cats actually commonly exhibit digestive disorders. And we found that many of them can be diagnosed from looking at the gut microbiome. In fact, our market research of more than 1,000 people indicates that there are at least 9 million cats and dogs in the US with chronic digestive disorders. The current solutions on the market include the use of antibiotics, steroids, supplements, and prescription diets. Most of these don't work, and they're expensive. And in some cases, they actually harm your pet. The average amount spent per pet is $500, and that doesn't include veterinary visits or food, which amounts to a total market size of $4.5 billion. $4.5 billion is a lot of money being spent on products that don't really work. Why don't they work? These products fail because they don't address the root of the problem. The use of antibiotics, antimicrobials, and modern diets have resulted in an imbalance in the gut microbiome of many people as well as animals. And these therapies fail to address these imbalances. A number of health conditions have been associated with an imbalance in gut bacteria. So here's an example from one of our customers from our Kitty Biome project. She has two cats who live together in the same house and are fed the same diet. First, there's Klein on the left. And Klein is healthy, and when we look at his gut bacteria, we see high diversity and that it's fairly balanced, which you can tell from the large number of colors in the chart on the left. And then there's Margot. Margot's sick. She has chronic diarrhea and has been diagnosed with IBD. And when we look at her gut bacteria, we find that it's out of balance and that there's one group, the purple group, that's dominating. Animal Biome is creating microbiome assessments that we offer directly to consumers, and they can look at their results and also record health observations through an interactive web app. And we'd be happy to demonstrate our product to you at our table outside. But when we talk to our customers and with veterinarians, they tell us it's not enough to know why their pet is sick. They want a treatment to make them healthy. And so we are currently developing, or we are creating microbiome therapies, starting with a fecal transplant pill that we developed a proprietary pipeline to produce, which ensures safety, efficacy, and stability at room temperature. We're currently conducting a pilot study of these fecal transplant pills for cats with IBD. The results so far are very promising. 86% of our participants who've completed the full course report a reduction in the frequency of diarrhea and or vomiting. 71% report increased appetite, improved fecal consistency, and weight gain. These are very promising results for cats who've been sick with chronic diarrhea for more than a year. So now I've told you about the problem of nine million cats and dogs with digestive disorders and the solutions that Animal Biome is creating. Now I'm going to tell you about how Animal Biome will make money. As I've mentioned, we have an assessment kit that we are already selling directly to consumers. This helps our customers to determine whether or not their pet would benefit from a fecal transplant. In addition, it helps us to grow our, our expanding database so that we can identify bacterial strains most associated with health for both cats and dogs. We will use these strains to create a, next, a line of next-generation probiotics that will augment our fecal transplant pills. 
And then finally, because having a healthy gut depends on a healthy diet, we're already partnering, we are already partnering with pet food companies committed to producing healthy digestion in pets. We have made tremendous progress since joining IndieBio only a few months ago. As I mentioned, our pilot study is already yielding very promising results. We've recently launched our pet health tracking web app and are on track to, to line up a clinical trial at UC Davis later this year. We plan to launch our next generation probiotic line next year. I have assembled a fantastic team of highly trained scientists and serial entrepreneurs, myself included, to create Animal Biome. Our scientific advisory board includes leading experts in the fields of microbiology and veterinary medicine. We are so excited to be using science to create the next generation of pet care products. We're currently raising a seed round, and we hope that you will join us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Andy Bio, for the opportunity to present. My name's Ed Painter. I'm co-founder and CEO of A2A Pharmaceuticals. We're using supervised machine learning to cr create better therapeutics. The problem we're after is the pharmaceutical industry's repetitive failures in clinical trials due to efficacy and toxicity problems due to the overuse of tools like high-throughput screening for the same databases over and over. A2A Pharmaceuticals is doing something different. Similar to the design of object-oriented software, one line at a time and in individual modules, we're designing new molecules for the patients who need them, one element at a time in individual fragments. This journey started with the work of Dr. Matthew Welsh at Columbia University where he was successful in developing the best new molecule for the RAS oncology target. This was used to form Kairas Therapeutics with a $5 million investment from Versant Ventures. The same technology was used to develop a new pharmaceutical for toxoplasmosis 90 times more effective than the current application. This is, despite, this is with decades of industry effort and millions of dollars spent, the effort for toxoplasmosis took a matter of months. This video shows the Sculpt system at work. First, we design very large databases with target-specific molecules and then screen through those molecules for the ones with the most efficacious binding activity to the specific target for synthesis in the, la in the laboratory. In contrast with our competition, we're developing molecules from, from scratch with very small fragments, while most of our competition is going through existing databases that are relatively small. We develop databases as many as 100 million different molecules using supervised machine learning to analyze and pick the best ones. A2A Pharmaceuticals is a therapeutics company. The best way that we can leverage our technology is to develop medications for the patients that need them. In the case of mixed lineage leukemia, infants would be the primary beneficiary. Using the A2A technology sculpt with an iterative process, we were able to develop new molecules for synthesis, seven of which we sent to Sanford Previs in San Diego for analysis. Today, I'm happy to announce the results from those tests were incredible. Versus the competition from the University of Michigan, we were at least two times more efficacious. As you can see from the top row, it is very specific to the type of cell line that it's intended with the cells not dying, except for those with the ones with uh, the mixed lineage leukemia, MLL menin, disruption. We killed 97% of the cells in 
the, the dosage indicated here. We use the same process across four different cell lines and were successful in every single one of those. This process was completed in just four months with the help of IndieBio and less than $100,000. This is despite industry efforts. Thank you. <laughs> Comparatively, industry efforts took many, many years, uh, at least four years and millions of dollars, and we won. So far, anyway. <laughs> Uh, this is A2A's pipeline. I already told you about the leukemia drug. We're also focusing on a solid tumor indication, YAPTEED, which is expressed across 50% of, on, on average, of solid tumors, including pancreatic, lung, and liver cancer. This market could be well over $5 billion. All of our indications are likely to be over a $1 billion. We're also focused on drug-resistant bacterial infections, with gram-negative bacteria in broad indications across a number of different types of illnesses and tuberculosis. We've already generated revenues from partnerships with pharmaceutical companies. We're actively negotiating for our oncology programs right now with several different large pharmaceutical companies. Our business model will enable us ultimately to work on it, as many as 15 or more programs spending less than a million dollars per program on average with potential proceeds of $400 million up front and as much as a billion over the lifetime of an individual program. We're filing provisional patents on all of our programs, both on the algorithms and the data, uh, the data used to discover the new chemical entities as well as the new chemical entities themselves. I'm proud to be working with Dr. Matthew Welsh who founded the, the Sculpt Design, as well as Brendan Kelly from Stanford University, who has seven years' experience working with companies similar like Pfizer and Eli Lilly. Dr. Sridhar Vampati was responsible for identifying the specific targets in terms of their biological importance, as well as their commercial importance. Recently, Dr. Sturgiopoulos joined us as chairman of the board. He comes to us with 10 years of experience from Bexalta, uh, Celgene, uh, as, as well, well as, uh, what's the other one, Novartis. Um, he will help us with partnerships and has been very active already. Please join us at A2A Pharmaceuticals. We're raising $5 million. We're already fully subscribed. We're looking for additional strategic investors to get the uh, new medications to the patients who need them. Thank you very much. Hello, San Francisco. Thank you for supporting biotech and IndieBio. I am Steve Cosme, CEO and co-founder of Pure Cultures. Pure Cultures is delivering innovative microbiome solutions for animal health. Factory farming, it's all about the higher profits. This has led to the massive amounts of antibiotics used in our livestock system to keep the animals healthy. These antibiotics, they travel up the food chain and eventually they end up in all the foods that we love to eat. Then our families ingest these foods and annually our families are in taking a large amount of antibiotics. These antibiotics cause antibiotic resistant bacteria which make people sick. But there's good news. Consumers are demanding a change. Chipotle and other large companies are listening and they're demanding that their farmers raise their animals without antibiotics. When Chipotle introduced its antibiotic-free pork offering, the demand outpaced the supply and their suppliers cut corners and led to quality and shortages. And it took Chipotle six months to find new suppliers in Europe. This antibiotic-free market is growing year over year at 34%, and it's allowing the producers to charge a 25% premium. Probiotics, traditionally, the good bacteria, they have limitations. They die during storage, transport, and, and harsh processing. 
Pre our opti-acid process is delivering prebiotics. These are the natural compounds that allow the probiotics to thrive. How do we do this? With our opti-acid process, first, we bioprospect from healthy animals for the specific bacteria. Second, we evaluate these bacteria for their metabolites. And we test them against their pathogen inhibition, against compounds such as E. coli and salmonella. Third, we quantify these metabolites to ensure that we produce a reliable product. And fourth, we scale this up in a fermentation process similar to brewing beer. I know how to do this because I have nearly two decades of experience in the probiotic industry, producing products for companies like Trader Joe and Perigo. And now, I'm bringing my knowledge to animal health. Our product competes with a major antibiotic that's used frequently in the animal space, tetracycline. You can see here that our product has equivalent killing powers against E. coli as tetracycline. We have completed a field trial in chickens at McCulley Farms in Colorado, where we decreased the hatch to harvest time by 45%. This is a 2x yield on that operation. We increased the animal weight by 10%, and we decreased the animal deaths, all without antibiotics or hormones. We have phenomenal success right now from all of our hard efforts. We have a pilot scheduled in Q1 with Pill and Family Farms with potential revenue of $525,000 in 2017. We have another trial set with a large egg laying operation, again with $400,000 in revenue in 2017. And because we know that our technology works in pets, we have an agreement with the world's largest food provider to work jointly with their scientists on novel pet products. This has a two-year exclusive manufacturing, generating between two and five million in annual sales. This company is so large, they wouldn't let us put, our, put their logo on our slide. We're really excited. We have committed revenues right now of $350,000 coming from the pet industry, making our $2.2 million revenue for 2017 a reality, and ramping up in the next three years to $15.5 million. We're attacking the massive $5 billion uh, animal supplementation market and the $1 billion pet supplementation market. And we're poised to take a large portion of both of those. We know that we're not the only company providing alternatives to antibiotics, but we do know that our product has antipathogen control and gut performance. We are selling directly to the farmers. We are targeting mid-sized farms, each farm generating half a million to one million dollars in revenue a year. We have a manufacturing agreement with a large contract fermentation company on the Oregon coast. This allows us to scale quickly ship internationally, and maintain our costs to, cr to continue the 50% margin. We have assembled a deep team, starting with myself. My probiotic experience and the ability to scale a, pro a manufacturing process, our CMO and co-founder, Colleen Cosme, with her marketing experience and product development, we are poised to generate sales quickly in 2017. We're seeking a $2 million seed round to expand our sales efforts and to increase our headcount. We are pure cultures. We are the right team, the right product at the right time. Please join us on our journey. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Dempsey, and I'm the founder and CEO of Venomics Therapeutics. <clears throat> At Venomics, we are making the next generation of antitoxin therapeutics. Our first focus is the snake antivenom market. Every year around the world, there are over 5 million snake bites. This results in over 500,000 amputations and 150,000 150, deaths. 
The World Health Organization has deemed this to be one of the world's most neglected public health issues. Naturally, this has led to a widespread fear and hatred of snakes, but snakes are not the real problem here. The real problem is reliance on old technology. So antivenom is made today in much the same way it was made back in 1890. S uh, snake venom is milked from a snake, injected into a horse, and over many months, the horse produces antibodies against the toxins in the venom. What you end up with is conventional antivenom. Conventional antivenom, unfortunately, does not always work. It's associated with a very difficult production process requiring an army of snakes, horses, and the people that handle these animals. It has side effects because you're taking horse antibodies and you're putting them into a human system. And last, it's restricted in its treatment because it only works for the snakes that were used in the immunization process. We decided it was time for a change, and we are developing the world's first universal recombinant snake antivenom. We, we are harnessing the power of a special kind of antibody known as a single domain antibody <clears throat> that has a variety of advantages for our application. They're safe because their sequences resemble the sequences of human antibodies. They're effective because they show high affinity binding to conserved epitopes and snake toxins. And they're robust. Their solubility and their stability means that for the first time ever, our antivenom can be available in the field. Introducing the EpiPen for snake bites. <laughs> this is particularly important for, uh, for snake bites because, as we say, time is tissue. So, how are we doing this? <laughs> we started with our proprietary libraries of billions of antibodies, and we've screened these against the clinically significant toxins present in all snake venom. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And how do you find a needle in a haystack? You bring a magnet. In this analogy, the magnet is our toxin, and the needle are our antibody candidates. We then take our candidates, we sequence them, and we can put them into bacteria, which allows us to manufacture them at scale in microbial fermentation systems. We're happy to announce that we are seeing early preclinical success in binding to some of the most dangerous species in both Asia as well as the United States. The snake antivenom market is a large and largely underserved market. <clears throat> the main regions that we are focused on are Asia, Africa, South America, and the United States, including a relatively large veterinary market in the United States. Each of these areas has distinct antivenom suppliers, but all of them are relying on old horse antibody technology. We're operating in a sweet spot for bringing drugs to market. Our indication is an acute indication, which means that we can perform our clinical trials at a fraction of the time of others. We're able to do all of our clinical trials overseas, where the people need it. And we qualify for fast-track status with regulatory agencies. This is allowing us to get to market at about 50% of the time and less than 10% of the cost of typical drug development process. So we started here at IndieBio with our targets and our proprietary libraries, and in the past four months, we've been able to develop our candidates, and we are now filing our patent. We're now moving into our preclinical studies, and we would like to finish with our phase one clinical trials by the end of next summer. This will pave the way for us to move into our phase two and phase three, and we are expecting a commercial rollout, approval and commercial rollout, uh, by the end of 2019. We are starting off in Asia, where it's almost half of the snake bite incidents in the world. We will then have three product iterations, one for Africa, one for South America, and one for the United States. Our customers are government organizations and nonprofits who purchase antivenom in bulk to supply the citizens of developing countries who are deeply affected. We also plan to license our products to leading pharmaceutical companies in these regions to help us with distribution. I'm also happy to announce that we have had some uh, interest from several of the key prominent players in our area, in our space, and uh, we have recently received a letter of intent for a milestone-based licensing deal that's valued upwards of $200 million. <laughs> Their help with our preclinical studies, manufacturing, 
and clinical trials will help us to get to market in India and the rest of Asia. Our team is comprised of myself as CEO, Dipankar Roy, our COO, and Alex Capavilla, our CSO. We each have scientific and business experience in both big pharma as well as the biotech startup space. We have complementary skills, but we all share the same vision of getting our solution out to the people who need it most. So what's next for us? We have noticed that our platform is perfectly, uh, is uniquely poised to uh, create bacterial antitoxins. So we are looking first at the antibiotic resistant strains, and we would also like to focus on strains that are of great importance to biodefense contracts. We're now raising a $3 million seed round. This capital will enable us to demonstrate clinical safety for Vipax in Asia, and will also enable us to generate our antibacterial candidates. In the time that I've been up here speaking with you, two people have died from, from a snake bite. This is preventable, and we are in a unique position to change an industry and change the lives of those affected by this, dis this uh, disorder. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm Vivian, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Viax Technologies. I'm here to tell you guys about the future of filtration and why it matters. So last month, one of the biggest winemakers in the world called us and told us about a very real and interesting problem they have. They have stinky wine. This is because the same process used to produce their vintages also sometimes have undesirable aroma or stability by chemical byproducts that affect the smell, taste, and stability of the wine. This is an important problem that they would love to solve. However, using conventional methods that are based on an iteration from the size occlusion methods stemming from rock and sand, uh, conventional methods generally utilize large amounts of pressure to push liquid through tiny pores. This is extremely expensive, um, requires high energy costs, and has trillions of dollars in environmental costs yearly. And it simply just does not solve the problem. Because what the winemaker truly wants is just to selectively pull these compounds out of the liquid. This is where Viax comes in. We make special functionalized membranes that are able to selectively filter out undesirable compounds while leaving the rest of the solution intact. This is huge for the food and beverage and wastewater as well as pharma industries. They each have large liquid treatment like on your left that uh, includes reverse osmosis as well as ion exchange in addition to microfiltration and other nanofiltration um, solutions. They require multiple process streams and are ex extremely expensive to operate. With our technology platform, we're able to reduce that solution into a compact membrane that's able to selectively pull out the compounds of choice. This has a very real economic consequence because we reduce the steps required as well as the cost required, leading to a 10x cost in labor and um, energy reduction. So it's as simple as the membrane because what we make are functional membranes. In my hand is a cartridge that is specially uh, designed to filter out mercury. So how do we do this? We start from the lowly lobster shell. It's not the lobster, but what's inside the exoskeleton. The lobster exoskeleton is one of many abundant bio waste that is rich in chitin, a naturally occurring polysaccharide that's the second most abundant polysaccharide in the world. And at Viax, we turn chitin bio waste into the most advanced filtration systems in the world. So we start in the laboratory where we liquefy the polymer. 
then this is where we start to make filtration smart. We're able to program our material to be compound selective at resolutions that are on the element level. Then we're able to scale rapidly with a nanofiber platform, which allows us to create compact tangential flow systems specifically designed to select particular molecules out of solution. We have an enormous scalability, scalable advantage. So at our current cost of production, we're extremely competitive with existing incumbent products. And with our milestones and um, our milestones in the past next five years, we're able to rapidly scale down our cost, increasing overall profit margin. Viax has complete IP ownership over our um, portfolio, which leads to um, IP ownership over a range of synthetic biomaterials. Although we retain strong, strong ties with the UC California system, namely Berkeley and San Diego, and we've achieved a lot. So we've achieved uh, bactericide, um, mercury removal, and magnesium removal, as well as a MERV rating of 19 plus. This gives us the confidence to tackle, uh, to use our platform to tackle more specific technology. And simply in our space is extremely fragmented. Each vertical are worth billions of dollars and these large companies are extremely specialized. We have an encompassing technology that's able to consolidate the market needs. We've already have traction um, in these spaces. We're partnering with extremely large automaker brands, biopharma, and wastewater treatment. In the next two years, we anticipate to be um, rolling out product in each of these verticals. So furthermore, this is not only good for the, uh, the enterprise, but also good for the environment. Because by selecting a natural uh, bio waste as our starting material, our ending material can go back into the environment. And this is something that our customers tell us they want and are willing to pay a premium for. We have a simple but powerful business model to apply our technology to specific spaces. We have an upfront R&D deposit model with a standardized and resale um, amounting to 10 to 20 million dollars for each customer lifetime value. And our goal is to use this technology to provide the best filtration solution, to minimize environmental impact, as well as bring specificity of control over process fees to consumer products. And we're on track to reaching our aggressive milestones. We're supported by an amazing team with background in uh, nanotechnologies, uh, desalination technology, as well as a, a lineage through NSF, Berkeley, Berkeley Labs, as well as um, very fortunate to be a part of IndieBio's uh, fourth cohort. So I'm very pleased to announce that we have closed the majority of our fundraising. We're raising $4 million in seed fundraising. And now we're looking for strategic partners as well as um, like-minded scientists that wants to join us in the journey to make the world a more sustainable place. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Meron. I'm co-founder and CEO of NeuroCore. I'm here to talk to you about an effective treatment for depression. Depression is not sadness. Clinical depression is among few disorders in medicine where a person actually says, I would kill myself if I had a chance. And every year we have more than 16 million adults who are diagnosed with clinical depression. They spend more than $11 billion a year in the first line of therapy on prescription drugs. But more than 4 million adults remain drug-resistant every year. We don't know how to treat them without hospitalization. And, and we have a drug-resistant depression crisis. We need non-drug treatments. In fact, 
the most effective treatment known for clinical depression is a non-drug treatment, electroconvulsive therapy or electroshock therapy. It is the most effective, but it's brutal. It involves hospitalization and anesthesia. And it has severe cognitive side effects. Less than 1% of patients are willing to endure this type of therapy. But we learn so much from electroconvulsive therapy. We learn brain is an electrical circuit. We learn depression is a functional problem, a gridlock within the brain circuit. And we understand by applying electrical currents to the brain, we can induce unidirectional currents throughout the whole brain to remove these gridlocks. However, applying electrical pulses to the whole brain triggers seizure and convulsion as well, which is unpleasant. <laughs> Instead, we could use magnetic pulses in order to induce currents in a smaller area of the brain without triggering seizure and convulsion. This is known as magnetic brain stimulation, or RTMS, which is very attractive because it does not require hospitalization or anesthesia. It's outpatient. And it has no systemic side effects. It feels like a tapping on the head, and it's widely accepted by patients. However, today, RTMS is limited to multidirectional induction of currents, not unidirectional. And it has limited efficacy. It's not as good as electroconvulsive therapy. Enter NeuroCore. We have introduced Ward's first unidirectional RTMS. That is, we can induce currents in a small area of the brain in one direction, and it has improved efficacy. Our device includes an amplifier with patented circuits, a coil to deliver the magnetic pulses to the brain, and a treatment chair. We have received more than $2 million in the last two years in grants to develop this product and manufacture two units. Today, we are Health Canada approved. We have installed units in Canada. We have generated revenue in the last two years, and we are projecting additional revenue in 2019. We have also completed a safety study, as well as a controlled pilot on actual patients, and I'm going to share the data with you. We are very proud of these results. Remission rates have been calculated 12 weeks after the therapy, and the efficacy is approaching electroconvulsive therapy. However, effective treatment for depression alone is not enough. For, for depression, we need comprehensive care. We are rethinking mental health care ground up, and we are building our own clinics where we have dedicated concierge for each patient. We have a patient-centric culture to ensure patients are engaged with their treatment. Our go-to-market strategy in the U.S. is to partner up with large medical groups where we are responsible for the equipment and training of the staff as well as maintaining the service excellence, and our partners provide patients referrals. We have a hub model, multiple units per center, and such hub model with five units could generate more than $4 million a year at full capacity using existing CPT codes and existing reimbursement, Medicare, among others. We have forged our first partnership in the U.S. in order to set up three clinics in California in 2017, and we are all set to ramp up to 100% full capacity and generate more than $13 million a year in 2018. This is a patented platform applicable to a range of disorders, a range of psychiatric and neurological disorders. At this stage, we have a focus on drug-resistant depression, and finally, we have a multidisciplinary team. My background is in electrical engineering and experimental neuroscience, and I've received an Entrepreneurial Achievement Award for my work at NeuroCore. Adrian, my co-founder, is an award-winning scientist and engineer. Brittany has a background in psychology, and she's a certified trainer for service excellence by Ritz-Carlton. And finally, Jonathan is a pioneering psychiatrist who's well-known worldwide for his contributions to RTMS. We are raising a seed fund. We have raised $2 million of our $3 million goal in order to manufacture more units and grow our team. We are looking for additional strategic investors. Help us get more patients into remission faster. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Leonardo Alvarez. I am the CEO and co-founder of GEA Enzymes. And with our company, we are introducing a new way to engineer fats at a molecular level. Fats are really important component for food because they are highly related to the nutritional value and texture. And we can distinguish two types of fats. Saturated fats that are unhealthy because they can induce obesity and heart stroke. On the other hand, unsaturated fats that are healthier. Some research have shown that unsaturated fats can even decrease the cholesterol level in the bloodstream. Due to the issues related to saturated fats, most of the food companies have been trying to remove these fats from their products, but this is extremely difficult. The current technology is the centrifuge, but this is inefficient because you remove the entire amount of fats, so you also remove texture, flavor, and aroma. And finally, you obtain something like skimmed milk that most people don't like. Just in the US, companies have spent more than 10 billion trying to solve this problem. So what we're doing? In GE Enzymes, we create a proprietary bioinformatics platform that allows us to engineer proteins for different industrial applications. And this platform has the ability to identify critical patterns at a molecular level of proteins, so we can rapidly generate thousands of protein candidates per day. Finally, we obtain the right protein that works at the desired substrate, at the desired temperature, and at the desired pH. By using this method, we develop a set of enzymes that have the unprecedented ability to take saturated fats and turn them into unsaturated fats in a rapid and easy way. So now, we can handle fats at the molecular level. And we start by seek for a target. And we choose luxury dark chocolate, because everyone loves chocolate. And we love it so much that the global market is 90 billion. But chocolate has high concentration of saturated fats, so it's mostly unhealthy. When we decide to apply our set of enzymes into cocoa butter, something remarkable happened. We decrease 12% of saturated fats, but we also change the texture from solid cocoa butter into liquid cocoa butter. So we decide to move one step forward and create the world's first spreadable dark chocolate that is liquid at room temperature. So you can see that the common high-end chocolate is still solid at 86 Fahrenheit, and our new product is completely liquid, opening a whole new possibilities for chocolate manufacturers so they can create products like luxury ice cream coverture, or even the next generation dark chocolate Nutella. <laughs> Our business model is based on the co-development contract and licensing the technology. This includes upfront payment, milestone payment, and finally, royalties for such development. Our potential partnerships include huge multinationals among the food industry. In fact, we are working with three of those companies that combine 20% of the chocolate industry. And each of these contracts has a value of $4 million up front, plus milestone payments, plus a lifetime value of more than $200 million. But this is just the beginning, because the fat industry is staggering. It's worth more than $247 billion worldwide between food, pharma, and cosmetics. So we are planning to introduce our technology into different verticals within the next four years. Right now, we are working in the food industry and pharma industry. But then we're going to move to functional fatty acids, such as omega-3, and finally, cosmetics, to create luxury creams and body lotions. Our core team is composed by three biotechnology engineers. We start our company in Chile, funded by public grants, and also private investment. We have a laboratory there working full-time. So I promise you, GE Enzymes will become the world's first company to introduce totally synthetic proteins into an unexplored market. And we are working for that. We can engineer proteins, but also we can design a small to mid-sized protein. We are raising our 3 million seed round to scale the team and increase our capability to engage in co-development contracts. We have 2 million committed right now, so we invite you to join us to unleash the infinite potential of proteins. We are GE Enzymes. Thank you very much. You guys need a break, huh? 
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kareem, CEO. I'm co-founder of Mendel Health, and I'm also a physician. Last year, in March, I lost a patient to brain cancer, and just a week later, I find out about a breakthrough treatment that would have saved his life. I just didn't get to know about this on time. Now, when I joined med school, I joined it to save lives. But this patient's story is not a one-time thing. It's something that happens every week, even worse sometimes every day. Now, is that only me? Well, MD Anderson, the world's number one cancer center, did a research on their own patient's pool. And they find out that 40% of their patients never get to access world-class treatments that you would expect them to get just due to the lack of awareness of the doctor. I repeat, the lack of awareness of the doctor. Now imagine if someone ends up in some rural area. Imagine if someone is even overseas. This can't just be the case. But a few, we already know that doctors are really smart. They want to do the best for their patients. But if you get to know that research is doubling every nine years, right now medicine has 24 million publications when an average human being can read around 250 per year. On the other side, this is just one-third of a patient's medical record, and it's insanely growing with a lot of parameters. I'm talking about genetics, lab reports, MRIs, CT scans. It's just incredibly hard for one human being to sit in the middle, try to make the inferences between, and recommend the treatment for you all in 20 minutes. It's incredible. It just can't. Now, the, the problem is that not only is he not able to make the inferences, but the decisions that are made are made based on what I, as a physician, happened to know, rather than the collective knowledge of what we as humans know today. What if we replace the doctor? As a matter of fact, what if we augment the doctor with a super processing power super memory, something that can read research, that can understand medical records, that can make inferences between both of it, and at the same time, it doesn't sleep, it doesn't go to the bathroom, it's just continuously matching a patient to the breakthrough treatments. I mean, if something comes in tomorrow that matches my patient, I'm going to be the first one to know that. If I'm, as a patient, get something in two weeks later that's going to match my case, I deserve to be the first one to know that. This is Mendel.ai. Mendel.ai is a frictionless website. You log into the website. All what you need to do is you upload your medical records. If you don't have it, we can request those records for you. Once we have the records, we analyze this data against the database of almost every breakthrough treatment or clinical trial that is existent right now. And then you get a list of all the treatments with a match score that tells you how much is this treatment matching to your very specific case. Now, this is not to tell you this is the best treatment for you, but this is to give you, as a doctor or as a patient, a tool to start better and more smart conversations. And that is why patients get to have different content than doctors. We add videos, we change the language, we basically turn the treatment protocols into something that the patient can understand while doctors get more scientific stuff. Now, I think everyone thinks this is super logic, like, this is an obvious problem. Definitely technology should be there right now. Why nobody else is doing that? Well, the reason is, AI right now in medicine is more NLP-based, natural language processing. Think of yourself talking to Siri. We can understand research. We can understand medical records using the AI. But when it comes to making inferences between both of them, AI can't do that. What we do is we build human rules. A human being basically sits down and starts identifying if this happens and this happens, then this is a match or not. The problem is it's easy when you can do one rule, two rules, but medicine needs millions of these rules. And there is no AI that, there is no human being can, that can sit down and do that. Well, the insight that we in Mendel have is what if we teach this AI to basically start building its own roots. So I teamed up with my co-founder, one of the best data scientists. They've been working on data for the last, clinical data for the last six years. And we decided to take one technology that nobody thought it has an application in healthcare, 
and customize it with domain expertise so that it can start building its own routes. This wasn't as easy, because after building this technology, now you have to take it to med school. So we trained it with over 3,000 hours and over 80,000 training examples done by physicians. Not only that, every time we get a patient and the AI kind of gives a recommendation, one of our physicians sits down and corrects the AI, so it's a back loop. Think of it, we're having a kid, every time we get a piece of data, it's getting smarter and smarter and smarter but it was often a good start with over 80,000 training examples. Now, having a great technology in healthcare is one thing, but breaking the gridlock where patients do not trust new companies, they do not trust startups, they don't want to share their data with anyone, and on the other side, you have doctors who are reluctant to adopt any new technology, it's, it's hard. So we didn't want to just build the website, we have the website, but we don't want to just stop there. We built an API that can basically allow us to go to patients and doctors where they are already congregating. So if a doctor is sitting in front of an EMR and he gets a notification about one patient being matched to a treatment, this is Mendel working in the background. If a patient calls the American Cancer Society on the phone asking for a clinical trial, it used to take seven days for an agent to answer this call. Now, in a minute, this patient can start recommending treatments using Mendel.ai. This allows a frictionless interaction with our technology and allowed us to build the network effect. So in one month, by partnering with two organizations, one um, like an NGO organization, LLS, and another diagnostic lab like CGI, we're on a, off, we're on a start to start matching over 30,000 patients, and I'm talking about one month worth of sales. Now, I think every investor in this room now wants to know how do you guys make money? Well, if the patient calls a non-governmental organization or non-profit institution and they're using our API, we do not charge them. But if this patient decides, well, I need to have continuous matching, which basically means every time there's something that's matching my case, I need to know about it, we charge them a subscription fee. Actually, we have a lot of patients who are cancer-free, but they give us their medical records because they want to have a plan B if things went sour. On the other side, if a diagnostic lab or an EMR integrates our services, we charge them a dollar per API call. This part of the business is to pay the bills and to keep the lights on. We funnel this data into a database that can be monetized by working with pharma companies, giving them access to this data so that they can basically identify new biomarkers. They can also recruit patients for clinical trials and develop better treatments, which is at the end of the day in the favor of the patient. Now, this can build a sustainable business. This can build value to shareholders because it's a $24 billion market. Today, medicine is all about biomarkers. Medicine is about, if you have lung cancer, that means nothing. What kind of mutation do you have? So we need those biomarkers. Think of it like 23andMe. When you guys send a kid there, they don't make as much money doing the analysis. What they really make money off is using this data with pharma companies to come up with better treatments. So for instance, last year, Roche got access to 3,000 data points from 23andMe, and this sale alone went over $60 million. Now on the other side, the clinical trial recruitment and the search averages on $2 billion also, which is not a bad market to kind of keep the business going. This is my favorite slide. Technology is a glory, it's, it's a lure. It's something that people love to hear about. But getting patients and getting people to actually engage with this technology is a very rare thing. So the real competition, I can talk about our technology and how superior it is than anyone else in the market right now, but I think that our real competitive edge is the philosophy which Mendel is based on. We are building a superior, a superior technology for not superior hospitals or superior doctors who are already smart, we're building it for every patient or doctor who have internet access, whether it's in the US, Mexico, Egypt, some random jungle in Africa, I don't care. As long as they have internet access, they deserve to know what is the best and the latest treatment for their cancer. Now, this was only doable when we decided to take the step of engaging patients on a sentimental level and reformatting the content. We have algorithms literally to just reformat the content for patients. We also took the step of saying, you know what, we're not going to just be one silo. We are open for any company or any organization so that they integrate our API on it. We also built a technology that can scale. 
almost every investor in this room got to know about this company building an AI for this and AI for that, but we actually have an AI. The other thing is, this technology, along with what we did, allowed us to be on a good start for a network effect, which is the real defensibility of our technology, the real defensibility of our product. I'm supposed to talk about how my engineers and team are rock stars. They went to the school and they did that. Well, they did all of that. But I want to thank every single person because, uh, in my team because they were crazy enough and audacious to take one technology that nobody thought it can be applied in healthcare. It was basically more for images and videos and made it happen in four months and made patients able to now access treatments. So in four months, we went from zero to having a technology that is working. We were able to get traction. We were able to make this happen. And for that, I'm very thankful for every one of them. And trust me, they are rock star engineers. Well, um, at the moment, we are matching patients to clinical trials, and we want to move to matching them to other treatments, maybe approved drugs or guidelines. What I mean by guidelines is it's a well-known fact. If the patient is an old age and has multiple myeloma, he should not consider a bone marrow transplant. Well, research says now that there's some criteria. If the patient matches, he can get the bone marrow transplant. So we are working on the direction of having a Jarvis where you can ask, can my patient get medical uh, bone marrow transplant? We use the medical records and give you an answer. And this is our next step. For that, we need $2 million. And just today in the morning, um, we got a commitment for the biggest chunk of it with some of the most strategic partners in the Valley who can allow us get to the network if, uh, uh, critical mass faster than what we expected. Thank you, and I hope to see you soon. But one last thought. I think everyone in this room knows or lost someone for cancer. So this is not a startup. This is the difference between life and death because we don't know who is the next patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Arshia Firuzi, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rovada Solutions. At Rovada, we have developed a device that is enabling production-scale embryo engineering. Mice are the workhorse of medical research. These mice have been transformed in some way to represent a disease state in a human. Then, products and drugs are tested on the mice to determine their efficacy or safety. Unfortunately, creating these animals is a slow, costly, and laborious process. This is due to a step in their production known as microinjection. Microinjection is performed by a technician under a microscope. This technician, or microinjectionist, individually captures embryos and injects them with a reagent like CRISPR to cause a genetic change. A microinjectionist will need to process 400 embryos to create just one line of transgenic mice. It is the rate-limiting step in their production. The market for these model organisms sits at $1.56 billion with a 9% kegger. I would also like to note that it is a resilient market and continued to see growth through the recent financial crisis. Now at Rovada, we are approaching this embryo engineering problem from a completely different angle. Our technology is combining microfluidics with electronics to increase the throughput, increase the efficiency, and the cell survival rate of embryo engineering. Behind me is an illustration of our device. Embryos are placed in one end and flown through. Then, using microfluidic techniques, we capture them into individual wells. Here, electric fields are used in a process known as electroporation to open and close the embryos, allowing the surrounding reagent to flow in. Once the process is complete, the embryos are retrieved from the original container. Behind me are three pictures showing this process in action on our chip. First, we see an embryo in a trap. Then, it is surrounded by reagent and electroprated, allowing the reagent to flow into it. And finally, the reagent is flushed away and we are left with the transformed embryo. The workflow for interacting with our device is as follows. First, a user will take their own mouse embryos and reagent and place them into a chip, which is then placed into our core device. Then at the push of a button, these embryos are transformed, and a few minutes later, the user may retrieve them for implantation into a pregnant mouse. This entire process 
has 100 times the throughput of that of microinjection, meaning that we can take weeks to months worth of a microinjectionist effort and complete it in less than one hour. Now, when we came to IndieBio, this was all an idea on a piece of paper. Over the next four months, we iterated at a rate of two prototypes a week to go from just an idea to a product. And our very first mice were born a couple weeks ago where we recorded 100% cell survival rates, or viability, and 75% transformation efficiency. Our rapid growth has meant we can already begin interacting with customers, and we have done so using a razor and razor blade business model. We are selling a core unit for $180,000 at an 83% margin. Then, in conjunction, single-use disposable chips are sold for $500 at a 98% margin. This means that a smaller facility, such as an academic institution, can generate over $70,000 in annual revenue for us, while larger facilities, such as those at customers like Jackson Laboratories or Charles River, can generate well over $250,000. Now, behind me is our go-to-market strategy. What you're looking at is a job posting for a microinjectionist of 10 to 15 years' experience. Now, whenever we see one of these, we follow up with the company asking if they would be interested in receiving one of our demos. Then, move from there to convert them into a customer. <laughs> As you can imagine, we've had some great success with this tactic, closing already over $300,000 in pre-sales with our partners at VIB Life Sciences, the Baylor College of Medicine, and Harbor Biomed. We've also secured the intellectual property surrounding our chip, the core device, and the interface between the two with our partners at Morrison and Forster. Now, my team that's made all this happen consists of myself, but also my COO, Gurkar and Sufi, and our CSO, Dr. Yusha Bey. We are advised by Dr. Josh Hyeth, a professor of electrical engineering, Todd Huffman, the CEO of 3Scan, and Professor Mark Fasciati, a professor of biomedical engineering. Now, before I end, I would like to explain to you all that this device can open and close any cell type and therefore transform any cell. So while in 2017, in October, we'll be entering the rodent model, the rodent model market, excuse me, over the next two years, we will continue adapting our technology to work with the embryos of other transgenic organisms and eventually to work with completely different cell lines, such as those of plants, stem cells, fungi, the, the list goes on and on. The future is transgenics, and the reason I say that is that we are already speaking with our collaborators about applications with organ farms to solve the organ donation crisis, using the gene drive in mosquitoes to fight diseases like malaria and Zika virus, even cybernetic applications. So please join us as we raise our $2.5 million seed round to scale our production and meet customer demand, as well as to continue our R&D so we can enter these other verticals. Thank you. All right. So what'd you guys think? Was this... Uh was, was this worth coming out in the rain for? I hope so. Let's give a huge round of applause to all the teams. They've worked super, super hard. Thank you all. And a round of applause for yourselves for again coming and being an early participant in, in truly what we're seeing is reshaping the world. I think, uh, I hope that everyone sees, you know, what we're so impressed by is the breadth of the companies changing uh, different areas, right? It, it's, uh, it's really quite astonishing what used to be just thought of as therapeutics, uh, technology that can now reshape things all around us. So again, and a, a huge uh, round of applause for the team who worked tirelessly to make sure all of this happened uh, together. Yeah, thank you. And, and so finally, I think uh, now we'd love for everyone to go out, meet the teams, but could we uh, do us all a favor and uh, give a little bit of a preference for the investors and press to talk to the teams early on? There, it's not very often that so many investors and so many press are here in one place for the teams to actually talk to. So uh, they'll be trying to, to, to get as many contacts and as much of their story out as possible. So uh, if you're saying congratulations or something like that, um, please understand if, if uh, the teams are looking to, to talk to uh, the press or investors that they're looking for. Also, thank you. Uh, if you are looking to get in touch with any of these teams right now, you can see up here, 
demoday.indiebio.co has a list of every team, all the founders, everyone's emails, and contact information. It should be in, in, very easy uh, to, to reach all of them or any of them uh, that you need to. So again, thank you so much uh, from, from all of us for coming out today. And uh, we will see you again in about six months for the next batch. But oh, and I hope you enjoyed the new, uh, the new venue. Uh, we plan to stay here, yeah. <laughs> thank you guys. See you outside. <laughs>